starting tomorrow, we have five days of football. The only thing I can say is y'all can have Christmas. How about that? Y'all can have it. Y'all can have Thanksgiving, all that stuff. Just give me this amount of football. I can't wait when we get into the time where it's like football like every day, almost for a month, with like Maction, Fun Belt, Bishop Sycamore tricking ESPN again or something. There's a documentary coming yeah, out. Yeah, I heard about that. Yep. So that's a real, that, that's a real documentary. There's a legitimately do- a Y'all documentary. Y'all got, how do you fall Unless we're for getting that? faked on that too. Yeah, yeah. how do you, how do you fall for that? But like, how if you're, did you not have one person that's like, guys, uh, I called all my connects and they've never recruited a kid. Well, who, who fell for it? ESPN. That's, that's how. It's ESPN. Well, it's not, it's, uh, speaking of though, Backyard Brawl Thursday. Yeah. Purdue, Penn State Thursday. Like I said, I, I was talking this morning with Reed. I was like, I haven't been ex- this excited about a backyard brawl since both my uncles were beefing in 2008. In 2008? And, yeah, that was a showdown. The year of our Lord. Speaking of Thanksgiving. Yeah. Oh, believe me, year it was. Of one, of, one of them almost met him. So, like, <laughs> in person. So, anyway, y'all, y'all ready? Y'all ready to get it kicked off? I say you kick it off. You mm. want me to kick it off? Jacked yeah, and tan? Complete the yeah, metaphor. let's get the ball. Let's get the tee out. Let's yeah. do it. Here we go. Mitch Sherman of The Athletic joins us to discuss Nebraska's future. Tom Luganbill helps us break down this week and weekend's matchups. And is the NFL really considering using a new football for Thursday night games? I'm Jake Crane, and welcome to Crane & Company. When you hear the words Nebraska athletics, the first thing that comes to mind is the Scott Frost debacle and the football team continuing to struggle as his tenure seems to be waning. And for all the loyal Huskers out there, I wish that was where the story ended. But turns out, it's only where it begins. Yes, Nebraska's struggling in football. They're 15 and 30 under Frost, and after stumbling out of the gate against Northwestern, it seems the times haven't changed. And one would think that Nebraska fans would have somewhat of a reprieve during the offseason, but that isn't the case either. The basketball team is just 24 and 67 over the last three years under Fred Hoiberg, which is a little worse percentage wise than the football team. Now, they've been struggling so badly that they restructured Hoiberg's buyout from 18 million to 11 million dropped his salary by a quarter million, and also forfeited a half million in bonuses. The two major sports have combined to go an atrocious 39 and 97 collectively, Mm. which considering the amount of following, resources, passion, and lack of a pro team in the state is astounding. Now, Nebraska fans have been let down time and time again, and any fan worth their salt can empathize with the fan base. But Husker fans don't want your empathy. They want results. And better yet, they deserve it. Nebraska's, has, Nebraska's always had quality baseball teams as well. Hell, the World Series is in Omaha. But even on the diamond, the Huskers have come up short recently and haven't made it to Omaha or even a super regional since 2005. Now, while these numbers bring up doom and gloom, and rightfully so, I do want to give Huskers fans some hope. Sports are cyclical. Teams have their time in the sun and in the darkness. And this, too, shall pass. You will have multiple products in major sports category that you can rely on for more than disappointment at some point. And the struggle makes the good times that much better. I know it's hard right now and there seems to be no end in sight, but success is always one good hire away. And with the cachet that Nebraska has, the door's pretty much always open. I don't buy the Nebraska's gonna be bad forever or Nebraska just can't do what it used to lines. They just haven't found the right person to lead. Was joining the Big Ten a good idea? Probably not. But the field is still 100 yards long and 53 and a third yards wide. The goal is still at 10 feet, and the mound hasn't moved. So the opportunities are still there. A good Nebraska is good for college athletics. The people love Nebraska, not just the football, basketball, or baseball team. The Huskers will be back at some point. And when that happens, watch out. Because once you lose grip, the minute you get it back, it's 10 times tighter. I'm going to bring in our co-host, former Michigan quarterback, David Cohn. My brother, former Western Colorado wide receiver Blaine Crane, who is growing a beard. I am. Man, you're just keeping people on their toes. You got to keep them guessing. You, you are. It's like you're just. You're, I'm keeping myself guessing. I just wake up every morning. It's like split. It's like you're. <laughs> it's like you're trying out for different roles for movies. Like uh, I am getting into my acting career. So you are. Yeah. Uh, you're yeah. getting into it. Mm-hmm. What finally, does that mean? Finally got the foot in the door. 
Well, you heard about the new Joker coming out. Might have a little bit of an extra role in that. An extra? Yep. Like, are you just going to be walking down the sidewalk? Or is yeah, I'm one of the guys he hits when he's, like, running. He's like, gets out of a cop car, hits me, and then does something crazy. So, you know. That'd be, that's a good role. I'm pretty excited about it, to be honest. That's a, you know? You're going to hang out with Joaquin? Put in the door. Put, seat at the table. Seat at the table. That's, that's all, all you need. can ask. Here comes Blaine's agent Twitter, Twitter handle. Oh, for sure. <laughs> Somebody that works for CAA. But, you know, getting, getting back to Nebraska, and we're going to bring Mitch Sherman in here kind of for a wholesome look. And, you know, the Scott Frost situation is a problem. But when you really look at the numbers, and I'm not talking about the periphery sports, and I'm not saying they're not important, gymnastics, softball, all that stuff. But the major three sports, if you're a Nebraska fan, man, it's just been a cycle of doom and gloom. I mean, you're, you're 15 and 30 in your last 45 in football, 27 and 64 or whatever it is in basketball, and haven't done anything in baseball in a while. I mean, Cone, how much is enough? First of all, kudos to you for those stats and talking about all of the sports. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I really, I wasn't even thinking about that in terms of Nebraska basketball and the way that they've struggled too. I'll just stick to football for now and just say, you know, I have so much respect for Nebraska and for Nebraska fans. And I just draw on my own experience. It's not that dissimilar to the situation with Jim Harbaugh at Michigan, especially if you take this previous season away, where you had a program that was, you know, could win nine or 10 games, but wasn't winning championships, wasn't necessarily beating your rival, and the head coach was a former star quarterback. Uh, one of your guys, the guy that you wanted to bring in, and obviously Scott Frost had that one great season at Central Florida. Um, for Nebraska fans, I think it is time to move on now, though. It was the right decision, I think, to bring Scott Frost back. The whole world changed during COVID. That was sort of an anomaly. Last year, you know, didn't get the job done at three and nine, but, you know, we were all talking in the offseason. When you lose that many games by one score, maybe it is just a personnel situation. Maybe in the age of the transfer portal, Scott Frost can get get in there, really do what he needs to to flip this program. Unfortunately, I know this is only one loss, but it is a, another close loss for Nebraska on foreign soil against Northwestern. And to me, what was most disappointing, like I said on Monday, was Scott Frost's comments after the game. Yeah. You know, because I thought the, the, the best thing Nebraska had going for him last Saturday was the offense, especially through the air in the first half with what Mark Whipple was able to do. So to come out and to criticize them on any front, I thought was very disappointing. I, I thought it was too. And, and if you go back and look at that game, we talked about this on Monday when we were reviewing it, they made no adjustments defensively. Mm -hmm. Absolutely no adjustments defensively. There is no reason that Northwestern should have played at the consistent level and were able to stay ahead of the chain so much because Nebraska was predictable. But if you're going to be predictable in the first half, adjust in the second half. To me, they scored enough points to win. I thought the offense played good enough. I, the fact you let Northwestern go up and down the field, you called the onside kick. Number one, Scott, the buck stops with you. Yeah. It's a, how can you sit there and look at your players as a man and say, you need to be accountable. You need to take responsibility the Nebraska way. Yet you're going to sit up there in front of everybody and throw guys under the bus instead of yourself. That's why you're going to get fired. And you should get fired. And if you go look at UCF, they really had one good year. One. Scott Frost, to me, is Millie Vanilli. Season. It's one, Millie Vanilli. One winning season. He had a one-hit wonder. One-hit wonder. They got hot, had the right personnel out there, and just because he was a good player, and that's a very common misconception. Whenever you you put coaches or former players into the bucket of, well, he's a former player, so he's going to be a great coach, or he's a former player, he's not going to be a great coach. They're they're individual people. Yeah. It, it while it may help a little bit being a, a, a former player or a former great player, like for Scott Frost to keep you kind of hanging around, counting crows style, it doesn't determine how good of a coach you are. There are guys that weren't good players at all that are some of the best coaches that we've ever had. There are guys that are some of the best players we've ever seen that couldn't coach their way out of a paper bag. They just could do what they did because they were told what to do. They were physically able to do it. And it's one thing to take in information and then you go do it. It's a totally different thing to either come up with information or take information that you've learned and explain that and take complex things and put them into layman's terms or be able to communicate it effectively to an 18 to 22 year old. Mm -hmm. That's a totally different skill set. 
Just because you can throw a good pass doesn't mean you can teach a good class. Let me clarify one thing when I was saying that Nebraska was a little bit similar to Michigan and some other schools, some other blue blood programs which have kind of struggled in terms of they're winning eight, nine, ten games a year but then moved on. I was talking about under the Bo Pelini Yeah, for era, sure. Yeah. Obviously. Well, Frank Solich. Felt, felt the I need go back to move on. To, yeah, and, I, and, and I understand it because, and that's why I say I respect Nebraska fans because they said, you know what? Not winning championships is not good enough. We don't want to win nine or ten games. We want the Eric Crowd days. We want the Tommy Frazier days. We want to win championships. So I respect that because Michigan was in a similar position. You see what Texas is trying to do. Southern Cal and Miami are both trying to make big moves now. So I understand that. But, you know, I think any Nebraska fan would like to have uh, Bo Pelini back right now. And to your point about being a great player doesn't make you a great coach, I 100% agree with that. I like you pointed that out. Even though on the college level, I will say it can potentially add uh, it, it can help in maybe recruiting. For, if, oh, you, yeah, if you dominated a for a school yeah. and people in the community know you, maybe you can keep some recruits closer to home. We talk about if Deion Sanders were to go back to Florida State, maybe he's not the greatest X's and O's coach of all time, right? But that would certainly have an effect. Yeah, well, and, and being a head coach, Blaine, we've talked about this all the time. I mean, you look at guys like Tommy Tuberville, there's some examples. Yeah. Being a head coach, it's like being a CEO. So if you're the CEO of, of I don't know, Post Serial, do you know exactly, you, can you go in there and make Lucky Charms from sure. scratch? No, but you know how to hire people and you know how to run an organization. A head coach doesn't have to be the guy that goes in there and says, all right, we need to run this play, we need to make this adjustment, we need to do this pump block. It's great if they can help. You have some head coaches that can, like you know the Hugh Freezes and Lane Kiffins and, and Steve Sarkeesians, guys that are coming up with a game plan. Then you have other guys that are like, all right, I know how to hire people. Most of it is knowing how to hire starts with coordinator, really it starts with a strength coach, then it goes to coordinators, then they go to assistants. If you know how to hire, you can coach for a long, long time and have a lot of success. Ed Orgeron, great example. Yeah. Dave Aranda and Joe Brady, you look like the smartest football coach in the world when those guys were the coordinators. All of a sudden they leave and it looks like you don't know how many guys are supposed to be on offense and defense. Mm. So it's who you hire, when you hire them, that can define you as a head coach if you're not exactly an X's and O's, you know, savant, Blaine? Well, the, I still think the worst thing for Nebraska was Scott Frost having that season at ECF. Mm -hmm. I mean, you, you, you always sometimes think the grass is green on the other side, and you have to realize how hard it is in college football to win nine games. Yeah. To win ten games. It's not easy, and you had that. And I know you want to go back to the glory days. Trust me, we all do. y'all. It, but it's a different time now. But the thing with Nebraska is this. We're, we're in a time where transfers, recruiting, NIL, you can come back and actually— You can you get flip a the guy, house quick. You can, you can flip the house. You can find your hero somewhere you never thought he would be. Just the, your knight in shining armor is not Scott Frost. Yeah. And you keep letting it go and letting it go. Guys, you just lost to a, a, a mediocre Northwestern team. That's a bunch of accountants. You're a mediocre Northwestern team. You gave up 500-plus yards in that game against a Northwestern offense. I don't know if they've ever done that in the history of the school. <laughs> you didn't make any adjustments in the second half. You got beat up up front. Yeah. You're Nebraska, and you got beat up up front against Northwestern. Something has to change. And I, I know you, you, well, we did this back then, we did that back then, but this isn't back then. Trust me, I'm an Auburn fan. There was a time when it was Auburn and LSU fighting for the top, and now every year it's, it's Bama and Georgia. Times be a-changing, and either you're going <laughs> to adapt or you're going to die, and Nebraska's slowly spinning around the drain. And at this time right now, it's probably the most critical move Nebraska's going to make in a long time. So d d that grass is not always greener. Go with somebody you know. You know that can get the job done. I'm with you. What's the booster club side? Okay, let me get in here. Um, I'm going to go ahead and put the poll out and let y'all know, let us sink in. Who wins the month in betting? Oh, Ooh, so we're betting on who's winning the exactly. month. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, All right, let's Very go meta. to, we have a donation here Ooh. from Drew Stein, $4.99. Drew, Drew, what's $4 up? $4 Drew. <laughs> so Scott Frost deserves his record at Nebraska due to his fake natty at UCF. Mm. Also, True. Nebraska d deserves this for firing a good coach. Yeah, and again... I blame the leadership there. Okay. I'm not blaming the family that lives in, in a rural town in Nebraska that's rooted for Nebraska their whole life, and their son's a wonk on. His last name's like Stein and Cougar or something. I'm not blaming <laughs> them. They didn't fire Scott Frost or, or fire Bo Pelini. They were upset, yes. The leadership at Nebraska just can't get it right. And if it was one coach, if this was just football, 
and baseball was doing good and basketball was doing good. You're like, all right, you know, it's we'll we'll get past this. Mm-hmm. It's everything. You look up, it's like being in the upside down in Stranger Things. There's not a good plate left, right, or straight. It's not a good place to look. And they don't have that one sport right now where they can look at and say, you know what? We'll rally behind this group. I don't know how the kite flying team's doing or the debate team or the hide and seek <laughs> team is doing, but the major three sports, baseball, basketball, and football, it's a horrible time right now. Well, they're definitely losing to Northwestern on the debate stage. Oh, they're Let's getting say murdered. That. I'm glad that that Booster Club member brought that up because I was talking to our director, Jonesy, yesterday. I said, some of this might be karma for Scott, Scott Frost claiming himself national champion uh, at, at UCF. And, and Jonesy made a good point. He said, no, I don't want a coach who doesn't say that because they went 13-0. and They didn't get a chance. Like, How do you feel about that? I mean, and it was Auburn they beat in the bowl game in a one-off when players opt out. Yeah. It's a complicated situation. You didn't, you, uh, the, the, and it's not their fault, okay? If y'all want to go home and tell your grandparents and, and make, use the same ring company that made my high school class ring to make national championship <laughs> rings, that's fine. But you're not recognized as, as the Don't national put it in champion. the stadium, right? Yeah, like you, you're self-proclaimed. <laughs> that's like me, like right, I'm self-proclaimed right now. I'm the, the best looking guy in the world. How about that? Best looking, smartest. Do we hang a banner? We should. Let's hang a banner. Best looking guy in the world. Smartest guy in the world. I wish we'd have had the playoff then, but guess what would have happened? The same thing that happened to Cincinnati. Mm -hmm. You would have ran into somebody that was just better than you, bigger than you, deeper than you, and they would have run base plays, first two weeks of fall camp plays, like Alabama ran against Cincinnati, and you lost by three or four touchdowns. So I will never denounce somebody for having a good year. I'll never say, you know what, if I was the head coach of UCF, I know myself. I'd have been like, yeah, we won it. <laughs> I know myself very well. But deep down in places I don't want to talk about, I know we didn't win it. <laughs> but it helps in recruiting. Hey, we're really the national champions. But uh, again, if you go look at the track record, Scott Frost caught lightning in a bottle, man. And Nebraska said, you know what? We're not breaking through as national champions. But we look over there and Scott Frost, the prodigal son, is undefeated? Being talked about as the next it up. All you, they sense. had to go get them. They had to go get them. made sense. They had to go get them. But guess what? It's like, like Billy Madison told old boy when he called uh, Veronica Vaughn, you blew it. <laughs> what else? All right, like? Popcorn Man, he says, as someone born and raised in Nebraska, we're enjoying, uh, enjoying the quality of volleyball at the moment. Yeah. They haven't been the same uh, since Pelini. And at least he won nine games every season. He did. Look, like I said, Bo Pelini's not not winning a ton of friends. I have his record right here. He goes, not, read it. Read that. I want everybody to take a second and think about how bad Nebraska's been and look at the guy they fired. Nine and four with a Gator Bowl win. Ten and four. Holiday Bowl win. Ten and four. Lost in the Holiday Bowl. Nine and four. Lost in the Capital One Bowl. Ten and four. Lost in the Capital One Bowl. Nine and four. Won the Gator Bowl. Nine and four, and then lost in the Holiday Bowl. So the first two years of Bo Pelini, he's won four more games than Nebraska has under the whole Scott Frost tenure. Mm. Really think about that. Let that one sink in for a second. I mean, again, like Blaine said, sometimes the grass isn't greener. Sometimes you don't know what you got to it's gone, and now you do, and you're left with Scott Frost, who looks like you know one of the one of the coaches on the NCAA game when you start out like on Road to Glory that's on high school jacked you know guy was an unbelievable player but it's just it just hasn't worked man it just hasn't all right mike nalrock he says who is the guy that could bring nebraska back i've said it multiple times who do I, who have i said fellas y'all know who it is you go from a frost to a freeze the marketing campaign would <laughs> oh it's come on insane. well number one that's copyrighted by crane and company, crane and company. so go ahead Mess around and find out. But <laughs> oh, Jamie Chadwell. You know, I think we Jamie Chadwell. We were talking about that the other day. Yeah. Right? Great coach. I don't think they do that just based off the record with Scott Frost here. Going to a group of five coach. I mean, if there was one who was well, going to work, it was the one who went undefeated and played quarterback for you. I think they may have reservations about that just from the optics. Not that Jamie Chadwell wouldn't be a good coach. Yes. Well, I think it's more of would Jamie, Jamie Chadwell take that job right You don't now. think he'd take that job? No. I think he's – look, Billy Napier looked around. He built up enough equity. He's like, I'm waiting for the perfect job for me. Hmm. turned down Auburn because they wouldn't give him full control, and they looked at his list and laughed of, of demands, basically. Florida did. He goes there. Smart move. You can win big at Florida. Nebraska's in a tough spot right now. If I'm Jamie Chadwell, am I really pushing all my equity and all the stock that I've built up 
to go to Nebraska. I don't know. I think Hugh Freeze is a perfect fit because guess what? He'd take that job in a heartbeat after what went down. It's the redemption tour. I'm telling you guys right now, if Nebraska hired, if they fire Scott Frost and hire Hugh Freeze, th- three years, they're a problem. Like, they're a legitimate problem. They get a good DC in there. Man, I'm telling you, like, like if Auburn got rid of Harson, Hugh Freeze is going to go somewhere. He can say what they want. I know it was ugly the way it went down. I think he's done his time a little bit. He's done a great job at Liberty. I know it's a great fit there. They've got more money than anybody realizes. But Hugh, want, Hugh wants back in the big lights. Mm. And somebody's going to give him a chance. And when they do, he's going to dance. I promise you that. One more, B. All right, Emmanuel C. So should, so should Nebraska have lingered in the Big 12 till last year and followed Texas and Oklahoma into the SEC? Big 10, I never understood the move. I, I never liked it. To me, Nebraska was like a consummate Big 12 staple. Like, you think of the Big 12. You think of Oklahoma, mm-hmm. Nebraska, Texas. And then they go to the Big 10 – and it's it's weird. It's almost like Maryland being in the Big Ten. Yeah. Like, why are you not in the ACC? Like, like it, you, it feels like it'd be a great fit in the ACC. Your style of play, I think it fits better. I, I it was just weird, man. It's like again, it's like you know, watching your mom kiss another guy. Like, I don't get yeah. it. A lot of frustrations with the conference realignment. We think about Oklahoma and Texas, and that is a great rivalry. But think about some of Oklahoma's other ones. Nebraska. Yeah. Oklahoma State. Yeah. Is that rivalry going to go away now? I don't know. It's you know. We can get frustrated about it, but I think there are bigger fish to fry on the college football landscape. Let's get this transfer portal situation figured out. Let's get NIL figured out, and maybe we can figure out a way to schedule some of these big marquee games despite conference realignment. Yeah, well, when you release everything at once, you're, you're, it's, it's like we're fighting nine fires right I know. Now. You, have, you release NIL. The transfer portal is a free-for-all. We have conference realignment. The rules are changing. Trying now to expand, there's expand the playoff. No period. Yeah, it's just— there's too many things going on at once. It reminds me of like, uh, what movie is it? Cinderella, where she walks down there and like all the pots and pans are washing themselves and everything. College football needs that button. Can we just hit that button, like the easy button? The red to just make it easier? I didn't yeah. see that version. You didn't see that the, version? She hits a button? No, well, she doesn't hit the oh. button, but she walks down there and-, and like, What's Cinderella? The, it's, it's, a, really it's a horror flick. Yeah. It's cool. where she's asleep and the prince kisses her and she wakes up. It's yeah, it's, it's actually, uh, it's what The Conjuring 3 is based on. <laughs> you go to jail for <laughs> stuff like that now. Yeah, that's exactly right. Uh, let's go five big questions. Let's go five big game. questions. All right, let's go to the NFL. The Saints made a big move. Saints mm-hmm. trade uh, Chauncey Gardner-Johnson and multiple picks to the Eagles for a 2023 fifth-round pick. A lot of our Saints boys, like T-Bob, a lot of them came out of the woodwork. Uh, who won this trade? Not the same. It's a layup. Uh, not the same. Yeah, here, hold on. Let me hit it out of the park. Uh, yeah, let me hit that layup out of the yeah. park. Um, put the ball on the, the tee. The beast ball. Yeah, exactly right. The Saints, this is like where when somebody becomes a big enough problem that's, that it's a distraction, are you willing to just let them go for, for a cheaper price? It's almost like a settlement. You know, it's like, all right, you can leave, and we'll take a cut. We'll, we'll, we'll take the loss here. It's like a divorce. All right, you want 55%? Just leave me alone. I'll give you 55%. Just leave me alone. Now, I've never been divorced. Hopefully, I won't. Love you, Reed. But uh, I feel like this is something where the Saints felt like enough was enough. But where is the limit where you're willing to hurt the organization because of somebody's feelings and the way that they're acting? Mm-hmm. Like, like where, where is that line? Really close to the season. It must have been, like, gotten pretty bad. You know, you have some people saying he wasn't talking to the coaches and, and there's some other stuff going on. But I just feel like whoever negotiating, I mean, y'all— you just were like, here, what do you want? What do you want? We'll take, I don't know, a fifth rounder. We need a good punter or something like that. I, I just, they got fleeced. But there's more to the story than just the surface level. You lost the trade. The Eagles have been loading up on defense, and we saw their schedule come out. They, you know, fairly, fairly easy schedule in the NFL. How much does this move help that Eagles defense? I mean, obviously, any move like this to help your secondary is going to be big, especially late in the season and in the playoffs. Um, I think this, well, one, Chauncey wanted to get paid a certain amount of money. The Saints didn't want to do it. Um, he's in a very vocal guy on the field. You know, got in Tom Brady's face after games, kicking the Falcon oh, sign. He did, yeah. Kicking the Falcon sign after games. So I think this is deeper than a lot of people think it is, but I think it's a great move for the Eagles. I think the Eagles have been making great moves since the draft, you know, getting a lot of Georgia guys, Dean, Davis. Um, I think the Eagles are legitimately turning into a problem in the next couple of years because you got to think they're an extremely young team. A.J. Brown, Devontae Smith, Jalen Hurts, your defense is young. So, I mean, you get a guy like this for this deal to just <laughs> booster up 
your secondary. So I love the Eagles' moves. Saints fans are not happy about this. There's a kind of a almost a pretty close relationship with Chauncey. He's he's the type of guy that fans can relate to. Uh, but now he's gone. But I still Saints Saints still have a great secondary. And, Still be a good team, but the Eagles won this trade. Yeah, it's like uh, on Semi Pro when they traded Monix for a washing machine. Like it just, it's a lot it's, of good movie references today. Thank you. Look, I'm like on fire. It. Let's Wednesday. keep that going. We got college Let's football. Let's keep tomorrow. that going. Oh, we will. Uh, you have the Eagles winning that division, right, Blaine? I do too. The, I got the Eagles. Wait, winning I, the oh, you do? Yeah. Oh, do you have the Cowboys? Yeah, I got. I think the, I the Cowboys. Okay. Yeah. I think it's a two horse race, right? Yeah. Giant, yeah. Giants, yeah. Giants, Tyrant Washington. Smith, like it's starting. Uh, we need to call our boy Brandon Graham. Get him on. See what he thinks yeah. about the There's defense. BG get BG. Let's stay on the NFL. Apparently, the NFL. Obviously, they partnered with Amazon for Thursday Night Football. There's a new football going around that Russell Wilson was throwing. I yeah, think Justin no Herbert was throwing. We have a video here. Guys, there's no way. There's a, Tell me there's a 0% chance that this is real, please. I, I really think this is like one of those, you remember the commercials, the fantasy files, like Pick Me, where they'd have like, you know, Terrell Owens like doing something crazy that you know is not real, or it's like Pick Me, and like Tom Brady is like, throwing a ball like 150 yards and hitting a cup off a trash can. I think this is it, but I have heard that this ball can make deliveries to your house while it's in the air. So it's really? pretty impressive. Let's go ahead and roll the clip. Right, left, right, throw. Ball. Oh, give me that one. Look at this. Yeah, it's, it's, it's already it's fake, it's already smaller. Yeah, look at it. That's a vortex it's mega flight. Yeah. It okay. whistles when you throw it. Look how hard he throws this ball. Right, left, right, throw. Oh my, no, 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 no way. No one told no me way. we're bringing back That'll the Vortex Mega Flight. Yeah. Give me a try. Yeah. This is, look, this is, uh, it's smart. Smart promo. Okay. Doing PR, we're talking about it. So obviously it worked. It's like, did you, you want to know how you know, like, marketing's good. When South Carolina changed their mascot's name to the general, I literally heard the Shaq and General commercial in my head. It's like, go to the General, save some time. I'm like, y'all got me. No, oh, I'm not going to be able it's to like, y'all got it, me. Y'all yeah. really Thanks a lot. got me on that. But Shaq, props, Shaq's I get it. in every commercial. He's in him Dude, and Charles Shaq Barker. Has he owns had, everything, man. Shaq has had such a great career. Yeah. He owns like Belt, like, J.C. Penney. Yeah. Like, he owns everything. Papa John's. He owns Papa John's. basically gave him like Papa John's after Shatner left. Was, I wonder how long it takes Shaq to eat a whole pizza. Not half long. the time? Probably not He's long. twice my size, so what is it, half the time? Can you imagine that? I'm not good at math. Anyway, it's here's science, something that I do know. 15-day IL for Justin Verlander. We were talking about it the other day. What does this mean for the Astros for the rest of the season? He just got to be healthy. I mean, they've built up enough lead right now. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not tripping, just like I'm not tripping about Gonsolin. Uh, going on the 15-day, even though, you know, Walker Bueller did have Tommy John and he's out. Shout out for the Dodgers for winning yesterday, but the Braves blew it. Not getting into that. But will this cost Verlander the Cy Young this, this season? I hope not. I hope not. But, you know, as much as you want to win the Cy Young, and I know Justin wants to win it, and there's a great case that he deserves it, you, have, you just came off a World Series loss. You almost got there, especially after the scandal and everything that had happened before then. He's got to be healthy going into the playoffs. He is the guy that you have to have. He is your horse that you're going to send in there to set the tone Game one, the guy that we're going to rely on, the guy that if we're in a pinch, because think about it. Let's say he has to go on short rest a couple times during the playoffs for them to survive. You don't want this lingering injury yeah. to affect that. So will it, will it have a huge effect on the Cy Young? It can, but I think this too is where playing so many games actually helps you in the realm where you have enough sample size and you've accumulated enough numbers yeah. to say, you know what, look, I may have missed 15 games, which... In reality, if you're a starting pitcher, 15 games or 15 days, you're not playing every day. Let's say it's 12 games. Let's say you go on four or five days rest. You're only missing three starts. So it's not, you're not missing enough time to, to derail you from the Cy Young, in my opinion. Yeah. Uh, Albert Pujols hit his 694th home run off his 450th different pitcher in his career. Again, boys, he's on the chase for 700. Does he get there? I, I think he gets there. But watching him chase this and Aaron, Ju Aaron Judge chase 61, because that's what I believe mm -hmm. is the record, is must-see baseball. It's giving me a little bit yeah. vibes back in the day. But right. 450, but watch this home run. If you're in audio, you're going to be able to hear it. This is not a cheapie. This ball is destroyed. Let's run the clip. Ooh, the Reds. O2 count. The next... Albert oh, yeah. <laughs> this is Oppo Taco. Opposite that ball field. is ripped. 
Mm. To be able to hit an opposite field home run on a line drive, you still have to have a lot of juice in the tank. Oh, Did this ball go 480 feet? No. Was it one that he turned on and hit up to Big Mac land? No. But that right there lets me know Albert's still got a little bit yeah. of juice in the tank, man. Yeah, man. And I'm starting to think – if the Cardinals do really well this year, this may, and I know they're set up for success. If they make a run and get close, Albert may come back for another you think year. So? Man, I'm starting to not now, a swan song what if here. He, what if he hits 698? We had a Bernie Mac, Bernie Mr. Mac 3000 situation, situation yeah. going on. He comes back to get 700. I, I can think, see that, but definitely not finishing a whole year next year. Well, it, you saw uh, again, what happened in the home run derby. It but was a send-off, everything. Think, Blaine, everything think Blaine what's the new rule in Major League Baseball? What can the National League now do? They can uh, yeah, DH. DH, I know, but I don't think he wants to do that. I think Albert's done after this year. I really do. Well, I hope he gets to 700 and retires. I think he does. Uh, I think he gets to 700 and he retires. I don't see him coming back next year. Even in, uh, First of all, watching him run around the bases hurts me, but, I mean, he's still... I mean, the, the amount of hand strength and forearm strength you have to do to hit that ball out, out of the ballpark, he still has it. And, yeah. and there's nothing watch, uh, nothing better watching, especially a baseball guy like me, is watching a ball get, getting hit where it's pitched. You yeah, know, a yeah. lot of these guys can get up there, have a launch angle, can Randy roll over and yank a lot of balls out of the ballpark. But watching a guy up there be fluid with his hands, see where it pitches, inside out a ball, wait on a perfect timing, and hit out the right center – Man, it's just poetry. In my That's world. how you hit 700 home runs, not 500 really long ones. That's how you hit the ball where it's pitched. Yep. But very excited. We're going to kind of change the tune a little bit here, uh, bringing our friend from The Athletic, Mitch Sherman, to talk some Nebraska. Mitch, what's up, man? Morning, guys. How are you? Doing good. Doing good. Appreciate you joining us early in the morning. Booster Club, get hot over there. I know we got some Nebraska fans in there. Mitch, I, I just, you know, I... I got some pointed questions. We have some pointed questions. But just after this Northwestern game, where is the fan base right now at Nebraska? I know it, there's probably a lot of people that are upset, but just an overview of your thoughts on where we sit right now on Wednesday. It's not in a good place. It's, it's probably as dark as times have been at Nebraska since 2017 with Mike Riley as coach his last season really went off the rails right at the beginning with the a loss against Northern Illinois. And, and then the writing was on the wall the entire time that Nebraska was going to make a change. And this was right as Scott Frost was, was rising at UCF to an undefeated season. And, you know, we know what happened from there. It was all excitement that that winter um, and through the next season and the season after that. And then people started to realize, well, you know, this isn't changing. And now here we are going into September and it's, yeah, it's rough. Scott Frost is 15 and 30 in 45 games at Nebraska, and he's five and 21 in in one score decisions. So it's it's um, you know I would say I wouldn't say that people have turned on him in mass, but it's moving in that direction much more so than even before the Northwestern game, even through this this previous off season when there was a good deal of positivity. Yeah, you know, Mitch, I think sometimes people forget about the Mike Riley tenure as well. He was sandwiched in between Pelini and then Scott Frost. And obviously the, that last year was, was not one that, that a lot of people want to remember with Mike. But when I look at it from a wholesome standpoint, it's not just the football team. I led the show with this. Fred Hoiberg as well uh, in the basketball court, a guy I know they had a lot of high hopes. At what point with baseball, not making the College World Series since 2005, at what point will the leadership outside of the coaches start being held responsible for this. And and Alberts, how much to blame is he? Well, Alberts has been in charge since July of last year, so he didn't make these hires. Um, I'm talking about to like to, I'm talking about to make these changes. Like how is is he gonna be the guy? Do you think he has the cachet to be able to make the changes with Scott Frost and Hoiberg? Because those are two major changes. What I mean by blame is the longer this goes, how much until he acquires some of the blame? Yeah, he, he has the cachet to make the changes. Um, he's a strong leader. Uh, he's shown the ability in, in previous stops in his administrative career. Well, the one previous stop in his administrative career at, at Division I University of Nebraska at Omaha to, to cut a football program, to cut a, a, um, a successful wrestling program. I mean, he made these decisions. They were difficult decisions. They were unpopular decisions. And that very well may be in the short term 
what he is required to do at Nebraska to get the ship afloat. You mentioned it's not just football. It's, it go, it's, it's across the, the range of men's sports um, at Nebraska that are, that are struggling right now in the Big Ten. So very successful in, in some other areas with women's sports. The women's volleyball team is ranked number one in the country to start the season um, last week. But, um, you know, what people are paying money to come see are guys, the majority of it, um, are guys like Scott Frost and Fred Hoiberg have success. And they're both flailing right now. Um, you know, Hoiberg, like Frost, received a restructured contract in this offseason. And that is uh, one step on Trev Albert's path to attempt to fix this. He absolutely has to be the guy to make those decisions and to make those fixes if they're needed. Nice. Mitch, Scott Frost contributed greatly to Nebraska as a player, not so much as a coach. Would Nebraska move on from Scott Frost and fire him in the middle of a season, or out of respect, would they allow him to finish the season up? Yeah, I almost think out of respect, you do it in the middle of the season if it's done. If it's completely cooked and it's over and you know they've secured a losing season at some point, I, I, I think you, you do it to just kind of end the pain. Um, you know, it may not even take seven losses. If Nebraska gets to a place where it is, uh, you know, three and four after the second, at the, at the time of the, the second bye week, the Huskers have a bye week. They're interestingly timed when you look at this decision that's ahead for, for Trevor Alberts and, you know, what may happen in the season or if it, if it waits, if the decision waits until after Black Friday, like, um, you know, is, is somewhat standard. Nebraska made the decision last year to retain him after the Ohio State game in early November when there were two uh, contests left on the schedule. This year, I think the key dates to note are, one, October 1st, the Indiana game. That is the the, um, the fifth game of the year. It's when it's the, the date that his that Frost's buyout goes from $15 million to $7.5 million. So yeah. it takes a, um, a whopping 50% cut. After that point, um, you know, anything really could happen. And the Huskers have um, a bye week before that Indiana game, after playing Oklahoma. Um, and then there's a bye week two weeks later after they go to Rutgers and Purdue. So there's yeah. a couple of traps right there. At Rutgers on a Friday night. Yeah. And then at Purdue, which Purdue would be a, a, a touchdown or a 10-point favorite over Nebraska if that game was, was played this mm-hmm. week. So – what happens then? That's seven games in. I see that as a real possibility if they're sitting at three and four that he could he could make that decision then and have an interim coach for the last uh, yeah. five games in the season. Yeah, I mean, I'm looking at the schedule now. I mean, even after that, you go to Michigan, you go to That's Iowa. Really you know, I mean, what 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 would need to happen here from a scheduling and a win loss standpoint for Scott Frost to keep his job uh, even after this opening loss, or is it just a foregone conclusion with Nebraska fans right now that this is his final season? Well, they're one game in, so, you know, a lot can happen. And the season's not ruined. Um, That was a constant message from Frost and the Nebraska players on Tuesday when they got back to Lincoln and got settled and met with the media at Memorial Stadium. Um, You know, they see two wins on the schedule coming up here these next two weeks against North Dakota and Georgia Southern. I think everybody generally sees two wins there. If it doesn't happen and Nebraska finds a way to lose one of those games, then, then I think it is a foregone conclusion. But you get through these two weeks, and then you have kind of a make-or-break game against Oklahoma um, on September 17th. Now, heading into the season, um, you know, I expected, I thought that Nebraska needed to be 3-1 and one going into that first bye week. So that would put Oklahoma um, as a must-win in this scenario. I think it is. I think it's a game you said that. Um, yeah. where if he wins that one, you know, then order is restored. Not necessarily long-term, but for the short term of the season then I think the in-season firing is no longer um, something that's looking like much of a possibility if he can beat Oklahoma. So that's what it's come down to for Nebraska and Scott Frost, and it's a pretty incredible position to be in considering the history of that series. And don't sleep on the Georgia Southern Eagles, Jay. Uh, States for those Hey, Hey, Mitch, I I do want to ask you, I know Blaine and the Booster Club have a couple questions as well. Would Nebraska, and I know we can play the hypothetical game, we can do that here, I'm not asking Nick Saban a question, but when you look at Nebraska, if they do get past Frost and, and move on from Frost, would they be willing to hire Hugh Freeze? No. Um, no? No, I don't think that's a fit. I don't think that's a Trev Albers kind of decision. Um, I, no. I mean, I, first of all, 
I don't, I don't think you freeze, uh, you know, you know, would necessarily entertain that. I mean, he, he is obviously uh, not there now, but he's a, he's an sec um, kind of guy. It doesn't, you know, I think there will be options out there that are much more um, attractive to Trev Alberts from a fit standpoint than to go with someone who is that out of, um, you know, just out of the wheelhouse for what you would think for Nebraska. I mean, his success as a coach speaks for itself, but the amount of baggage that he comes with, I don't think is something that Trev Alberts would want to take off. Yeah, Mitch, but if they did, though, and somehow that happened, if I made a shirt that said, from a frost to a freeze, you want to go 50-50 on it with me? Yeah, let's go. I'll, I like I'll, that. Uh, I like that. I like that. All right, big on shirts here. Yeah, <laughs> we'll make it white and red. It'll sell out in a second. I love it. I was going to trade at the Booster Club here. J Mac Volunteer wants to know, is Nebraska having a crisis because of lack of recruiting and resources or just failing to execute schematically late in games? Yeah, I mean, the recruiting is not on the par of Georgia or, or Ohio State or, you know, you could name 25 other programs probably that have recruited better than Nebraska over the last decade or even in the Frost era. You know, they've generally been near the top of the of the Big Ten. Uh, the transfer class this season and this kind of group with recruiting now was, was among the best in the Big Ten. So this is not an issue about having uh, too little talent on the roster. Um, the resources are absolutely there. Nebraska – Whoever the coach is next season, if it's Scott Frost walking back into the football facilities in, in, in July to get ready for a 23 season, or if there's a new guy and a new staff that are in charge, they're going to get the keys to a beautiful, state-of-the-art, $165 million giant behemoth of a building that houses the headquarters for Nebraska football and, and really um, is the centerpiece of the entire athletic department there on the Northwest uh, northeast side of, of Memorial Stadium. It's, it, you know, when they open that thing, it's going to be among the best five or six of those buildings in, in the entire country. So resources, you know, the ability to line the pockets of your football players through NIL, um, it's all in place for Nebraska. I mean, talk about, this is the Big Ten. Do you want to talk about resources? This league just signed a, a $1.2 billion deal with a group of TV networks and Nebraska is going to get its one sixteenth cut of the pie, which is you know going to be somewhere short of a hundred million dollars a year in multimedia rights revenue. So the resources are fine. It's the it's the foundation. It's the dysfunctional nature of some aspects of the football program. It is Frost and his inability to get out of his own way in so many instances that we've seen crop up even here again in the opener with his call for an onside kick in the third quarter of that game against Northwestern Saturday. Yeah. All right, love it. Travis Elrod, hashtag Ask Mitch. Is one of the problems in Nebraska that there are too many cooks in the kitchen, kind of like in Sarkeesian at Texas? Well, it's a question, I think, to ask this year about the offense. He brought in Mark Whipple to call plays and coordinate the offense and run things. And, you know, Frost is used to doing that himself since his days as a coordinator for Mark Helfrich back starting in 2013 at Oregon. He uh, has been the offensive play caller, you know, going through his time at UCF, the two seasons there, the four seasons in Nebraska, and he's struggling with it, the, with the ability to step away. And, and you know, he's admitted that, um, been fairly open about uh, wondering what he's going to do exactly with himself on game day. And I guess we saw on Saturday, you know, he's going to go impact the special teams in ways that may not have happened if he was the offensive play caller and it didn't turn out well. So, um, but I do think that, that, that he's self-aware and that he recognizes in the situation that Mark Whipple, uh, the play caller, does not want Scott to be around and giving his input in the heat of the moment. Um, there's time for that where they discuss things in the, in the um, lead up to the game, uh, even, you know, maybe some down times in the game, but when it's third and three um, and they've got to make a decision, it's going to be on Whipple. Um, and I think Frost is, is, has in one game, um, and we'll continue to probably get better at this stay out of the way. As for any potential other cooks in the kitchen, no, I think it's basically those two. And I don't, I don't yeah. think in a larger picture sense of how this program is run, that there's a whole lot of, um, there's a whole lot of issue. There's a whole lot of question or concern about who's in charge. Mm -hmm. Trev Alberts is in charge of this athletic department in charge of making decisions about the football program. Um, when, and then Scott Frost, of course, runs things um, from, from a coaching perspective.
Yeah, and you know, it's hard to tell a quarterback to stay out of the way. Sure. You know, it's one thing if, if you're the punter and you're the coach. It's different if you're the quarterback like <laughs> Scott Frost. It's like, all right, it's third and three, I'll do it myself. But Mitch, I appreciate it, my friend. Tell everybody where you can find your work. And I think if you're down, you just became the Nebraska plug. There you go. Um, whatever you guys want from me. Um, you can find me uh, at Mitch Sherman on Twitter and uh, absolutely subscribe to The Athletic and, and read all of our college football content. Also. Def definitely. Well, Mitch, thanks for getting up early with us, my friend. Uh, we'll definitely have you back on because you know as well as I do, this saga is just beginning. All it right. is. We've got 11 games ahead. <laughs> yeah, that's you. exactly right. All yeah. right. See, so, yeah, just glad you're not playing North Dakota State this weekend. You, you better be glad there's not a state at the end of that North Dakota. By the way, do you hear what he said <laughs> about the buyout? Oct after yeah. October 1st, it goes Sounds from 15 mil seven, to yeah. seven and a half. They're, wait, they're definitely going to wait until then. Okay. I mean, that's just sound. That, yeah, Anybody, that any, everybody knows that. Uh, but, Blaine, Booster Club, real quickly. All right, more Steven wants to know, will Scott Frost become a coordinator with Saban in Alabama and gain clarity as a head coach, the the, the head coach rehab center uh, over there in Alabama? Yeah, the, Al the Alabama Co Coach yep. Rehabilitation Center. Second and, chances. And, and center for places where coaches want to learn to coach good and, and do read other good. stuff good, yep. too. That's a Zoolander reference. Um, <laughs> coordinator, no. Yeah, coordinator, no. Uh, uh, analyst. Well, analyst. He's analyst. not going back to UCF. I mean, Gus Malzahn's turning into Gandalf out there the longer you look <laughs> at him. Uh, Gandalf the White, of course. Mm. Uh, but I see him taking a head group of five job. Yeah. I don't think he'd, he'd be an analyst. That's exactly what I think. It's not like he got caught, you know, like Mike Price or, uh, you know, like Sark or any of these guys, you know, some stuff off the field. He'll, he'll be fine. He'll go to a group of five and have success. And I hope he gets another shot because you never Me know that, that second go around. Probably at a place where you weren't a star player okay. would be a nice little change up yeah. for you, as crazy as that sounds. But anyways, if you want to watch the rest of the show, remember you can listen if you stay here. But if you want to watch, head over to the Daily Wire Plus. Become a member. Sign up. Join the crew. Or listen on Apple, Spotify, wherever you get your podcasts. Subscribe. Leave a five-star review and share it with all your friends. If you're watching on YouTube, hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, and turn that those notifications on. We'll be right back. And Cone's got my favorite segment of all time ever every Wednesday. It's Get Off My Lawn, so stick around. It's Wednesday, and it's right after the sub break. So you know what time it is. My good friend David Cohn, former Michigan quarterback and current father and husband, every six foot <laughs> seven, seven inches of him, is really an 80-year-old trapped in a 34-year-old's body. So we gave him a segment. It's called Get Off My Lawn. Cohn, what's your young old ass screaming at today? Today I am telling Michigan fans who don't say go blue to get off my lawn. Get out now. The University of Michigan has the third largest alumni base in the world. Everywhere you go on earth, you will see Michigan paraphernalia. Visit a taqueria in Mexico City, you'll see a Michigan hat. Safari in Tanzania, someone will have on a Wolverine t-shirt. I even saw a Michigan logo at a wedding in Columbus, Ohio. Granted, it was at the bottom of a urinal, but you get my point. Now, unfortunately, the vastness of our network does not often translate to school spirit. Over the years, I've calculated the various responses received when I call out our mantra, and the results are not pretty. As I speculate, only 50% of the time, fellas, does the individual targeted with my good nature team pride respond with go blue. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just shouting at random people with LSU gear. I'm going straight for the low hanging fruit when I see maize and blue attire. I feel like Colin Farrell in that movie In Bruges. Why didn't you wave hello to me today when I waved hello to you today? <laughs> and this is not just anecdotal. Michigan fans know exactly what I'm talking about. Some of the more popular responses I hear from these half-hearted fans after saying go blue are, hey, that's right, or thanks, man. Thanks, man. I'm not giving you a compliment. I'm trying to share in our rallying cry before football season starts. Can you imagine yelling Roll Tide to an Alabama fan and not hearing Roll Tide back? Try walking on the plains of Auburn and saying thank you when someone says War Eagle. You won't be invited home for Thanksgiving. But there is good news for Michigan fans. The 50% of us who care care deeply. And there's a lot to be proud of. Last season, we beat Ohio. 
We won the Big Ten, and we're so good, we have not one starting quarterback, <laughs> but two. Okay, so I'm instituting a new rule for my Michigan fans out there who think engaging in our battle cry is optional. Either respond with an impassioned go blue, or stop wearing your Wolverine gear completely. Because like JC said, less is more, there's plenty of us, and that's exactly how I feel about my lawn. So say go blue or stay off. <laughs> I, I love it, it. Dave. I Guys, love it. That's what if I said War Eagle to 50, you? 50% don't say go blue? 50% and look, and, I know and, what you're thinking. And you want to make the argument that the game's better than the Iron Bowl? Look, I don't want to talk about that right now. <laughs> oh, but no. I know what you're thinking. Well, David, people just don't respond to you because you're always yelling at people to get off your lawn. No, I have collected data yes. from Michigan fans. They know exactly. Run the what numbers. I'm they know what I'm talking about. It's uh, look. I'll I say go blue to somebody. I'll tell you, I'll get a deer in headlights more often. That than is not. That's insane. Why? Because like, Michigan fans are everywhere now. They're everywhere, and the fact. I mean, I can't imagine just not just not even being in Auburn, but seeing an Auburn fan saying War Eagle and then just looking at me. So like if you let's take oh, look this. where where, where where I'm from like that gets you that gets you put you'll in disappear yeah let's say that we like, were out they, in they, Vegas they right? they the jokers not bomb Auburn. you okay. like when we were out in Vegas see someone with an Auburn hat you give them War Eagle All there's that. a zero percent shot they don't say War Eagle yeah. of course they do mm, I, that's just hearing up. you say that as a friend of yours as a brother as an uncle to your child. And also as a friend of yours. It hurts me. <laughs> that one's been a long time coming, fellas. Dude, that one that felt one's like been that a one, long time coming. There was a lot of personal Collected a lot of there. data over time. I'm glad you got that out. Saved it for the, you know, the week of kickoff. Where on the doll did the Michigan fans touch you? <laughs> 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 All right, boy, what do we got? We got Tom Luganville coming here in a couple minutes. What do we got? Um, Sister Riggs wants you to know the jacket is on point for the It set. is Oh, thank point. you. Um, ben Shapiro's coming in town today, so I guess, you know, oh, big nice. boss man. Looks like you're about to go to try and sell helicopters at the Catalina Wine Mixer. Dude, you I know it's sell, the biggest helicopter. I could sell a helicopter. This one here got good blades, yeah. spin fast. It's like it's, it's the biggest helicopter sales convention in the West Coast. Yeah, we're going to make some sales. I don't know if you know that. All right, Zachary Jerome says the game is better than the Iron Bowl. Zachary, get off of my lawn. Zachary Jerome. Zach, listen, things. I need you to get close to my lawn and then realize that you need to never get on. You know what he says? Because like? that, that take... Again, you, I get it. It's top three rivalry. I'm, I'm with you. Yeah. We'll hold hands, sing kumbaya, yeah. and make s'mores, and, and eat them and laugh that and tell fun. stories together about it. But it's not better than the Iron Bowl for a couple reasons. I'm not diving too far into this. By the way, if you want to know the real reason, you need to go check out the head-to-head -head between me and Cone <laughs> yes. uh, on this. This was really was good. Fun. But same state, Auburn and Alabama. And guess what? We actually beat each other more than once out of every 15 years. So... That's a pretty cool story as well. I take offense to that. And Zachary Jerome sounds like a guy you say go blue to. That guy's giving you a go blue. Yeah, he's, sure. he's going to say go blue to while he's on your lawn. That's for supposed sure. to be. All right, Tempo says, uh, hashtag Ask Cranico, what is going to be your college football upset this week? He says he's got CMU over Oklahoma State. Ooh, I think they could cover because plus 22 Oklahoma is a weird State. number. I just 22. feel like Spencer Sanders. Well, we put out our list, right? Mm -hmm. It's up to what now? Uh, 22 and a half, I It's at 22 and a half, man. If that thing gets to 24 and a half. It was our top five list. You want yeah, to so it to uh, here's what here's what we had. Look at you. You're just, you're like an hey, inspector gadget. Gotta be on it, man. You're like my six foot seven Alexa. I'm really not prepared. Here it is. Yeah, <laughs> jazz flute. All right, uh, I think, and again, what I call an upset, anytime you're really plus money or you're the underdog, it's an upset. But I always go a field goal or more, right? So plus three or more. The most likely to me, like we said yesterday with Boomer on, is Purdue beating Penn State. I mean, you've got the blackout, Braun bringing back Aiden O'Connell. I don't trust Penn State. I'll go ahead and say it. Did James Franklin do the greatest coaching job ever of all time by winning two nine games twice at Vanderbilt? Of course. That's insane. Of course. But it, apparently the, the pixie dust has worn off. Yeah. Sean Clifford, I don't believe. Look, the Roberts, the Roberts kid's a good wide receiver, the Washington kid as well, but they're not Jahan Dotson. The offensive line could barely block somebody on Facebook right mm. now. And until that improves, block my stuff. or I can see it, I don't believe, because I think if it's a stalemate up front with Purdue and them, then Purdue's got a huge advantage. Mm. A huge advantage. I think there's going to be a lot of points scored in this game. I'm going to go ahead and tell you right now, I haven't picked my bet yet for tomorrow. One of them's going to be Purdue plus three and a half. I can go ahead and tell you that because I don't see it go back up to four. And I want to see what the over-under is on that because there's going to be points scored in this game. But at some point, Sean Clifford's going to blow it for a couple reasons. One, he's not playing Auburn. And two, Jahan Dotson's not there anymore. I like West Virginia over Pitt. 
Really? Yeah, the more I look at it, I saw some yesterday. Really? West Virginia had bought 80% of the tickets. I don't care if they bought 100%. 80% of the tickets. Of their that. allotment? Hold on. Yeah. Of their allotment or of the tickets sold? Of the tickets sold. It is 80%. the backyard brawl. You're a big JT Daniels fan. You're, you're, I think you're overinflating JT yeah. Daniels. Does, I mean, seven and a half. I heard it might creep down to six and a half. It's at eight now. It's at, it's eight. at eight. I saw now. it seven, uh, seven and a half. It was eight I this morning on I wouldn't games. be surprised if that got to creep down to six and a half. Look, plus 240 with JT Daniels. They haven't seen it. Um, Pitt hasn't seen it. Really don't know about Pitt. You lost a lot. Pickett, now you bring back a good old line. You lost Jordan. And D-line. Uh, and D-line, but you you lose Pickett. You lose Jordan Addison, which matters. So we'll see. If anything, I'm going to like, I, if I'm going to take an upset bet this week, money line, other than Oregon. Here's why I don't <laughs> like it. West Virginia finished last in the conference in sacks given up. They had one of the worst offensive lines in the country in Power 5, and Pittsburgh is rolling some dogs out there on the defensive line. And Narduzzi can coach them up on defense. Offensively with Keaton Slovis, we got to see. I know you lost Addison, but you got a couple guys on the outside there that can really make plays. You got another NFL guy on the outside. The offensive line should be good enough. You have your leading rusher from last year who only played in six games. I think he had 651 yards, something like that. Uh, Adam Bakaye, I think is his last name. I know I said that totally wrong, but I'm close, and I want points for that. Lost your coordinator, too. You did. Mark you lost your coordinator, but I'm telling you, I think backyard brawl at home with Pitt, you're better up front. Slovis can do it. You have the weapons. JT Daniels hasn't really done it yeah. consistently on the college level. I don't know. I feel like it may get ugly. How about Western Michigan at Michigan State? Maybe sprinkle a little plus 1,100. You're just, you, you know? keep trying to, you huh? you can't make, make fetch a thing. I can't make You're not going to make fetch a thing, Gretchen. I failed again. How many times? I failed again. Even Tom Lugaville's laughing. Yeah, about yeah, me. he knows. Well, you are. What did you say in your get off my lawn? He's like, you're, you know, you, you're not. Uh, what's the, the Regina George? Regina George. You're, you're Gretchen yeah, you're Wieners. More like a Gretchen Wieners, which is great because your dad still invented the toaster strudel. You I love I mean? how much you love Mean Girls, but the other guys just doesn't. doesn't do well, it. first of all, I had to like look that stuff up. What, like you? I just yeah. added Did off the though? top. But if we're Did you but though? I'm willing to go out on a limb and say, yeah, Mean Girls is. Way it's a better, good movie. Way better than the other. Would you be a member of the Plastics? Huh? Would you be a member of no, the No, give me my phone back, by the no, way. No, see, so you didn't go look it up. You knew it exactly <laughs> right. You know all about it. You failed the test. Oh, all man. right, somebody that's going to pass the test, and he's wearing a Batman shirt, so the yes. signal must be up. ESPN's Tom Lugan. Bill's going to join us weekly. Surprise, kids. You're welcome. Like I said, y'all can have Christmas. Lugs, what's up? How are you doing this morning, guys? Uh, doing great. Uh, me and you talked a little bit earlier. We've talked a ton of Nebraska, but I know you have a take, and then we'll move on from the Cornhuskers. What are your thoughts on Nebraska? You know, guys, I got to be honest with you. I, I think that people aren't looking at the history of how this Nebraska program got to this point. All right. You got to go way back to the days of 105 scholarships versus 85 scholarships, mm -hmm. unlimited walk ons to walk on restrictions, no cable television. I've always said the worst thing that ever happened to Nebraska was the advent of cable television because it created the arms race. It expanded the bowl picture. It put everybody on television. Whereas in the old days, what you had a handful of teams that played on TV, a handful of bowl games, and that was it. Right. And so that's how they were able to gain this status and this exposure from a national perspective. Flash forward to now and take a look at the world we're living in in recruiting, right? We're in everything's been accelerated. Eighth graders, freshmen, sophomores, all trying to get on campus in an unofficial capacity. They're going to games. They're going to junior days. They're going to camps. Have you looked at the talent pool, not only in the state of Nebraska, but the states that border it? Wyoming, no players. South mm -hmm. Dakota, no players. Kansas, no players. Iowa, okay? What we're not we're, we're not talking about a Clemson or an Alabama or an Ohio State or Georgia where the coach just throws a rock outside of their office and hits a great player within 100 miles of campus. So when you got Texas A&M, Texas LSU, Alabama and they're getting kids on campus all the time, all right? How is Nebraska supposed to do that? And I'm sitting there watching that game the other day and I'm looking at who their main target is on offense. He's a transfer from New Mexico State. Yeah. Garcia what does that man. tell you about Nebraska's player pool right now? What does that tell you about their roster? No disrespect to that player, but guys, we can rip on Scott Frost all we want. They're not very good. They can't run on defense. 
They don't have pass rushers. Yep. They don't have any juice at the skill spots on offense. They're very average in the offensive line. We can take the whole onside kick fiasco and set that aside. The reality is they're not very good. Not yeah, very and they good didn't players. lose that game because of one play. You don't lose games no. because of one play. I think a lot of people don't understand that. But I'll tell you Absolutely. another thing. I'll tell you another thing, Lugs, before we get off of it. Huddle being invented. Now coaches being able to watch kids from one coast to the other without having to send in yep. DVDs and having those connections. The greatest irony of all, you know where Huddle was invented? Hmm. Omaha, Nebraska. Nebraska. Yeah. That's exactly, That's exactly right. right. Hey, I'll add one more thing to this, Go guys. Ahead. 2014, I think, was the class. Don't quote me on that. But we really started studying this with them. And we did um, an average miles away from Lincoln, Nebraska, of every kid that signed in the class, and it was over 900 miles. That's nuts. That's I mean, absolutely nuts. The gas so expensive nowadays, too. I mean, <laughs> hell, hey, no, nobody's getting less Taylor Swift, yeah. Senator Jet. Yeah. I mean, how are you getting those kids to camp? That's why. I wonder what that is compared to, let's say, in Alabama, like or in Georgia. I bet well, it's. Oh, I, let's I, look I, at this. Look at the University of Houston. The three recruiting classes that Tom Herman brought into Houston when he was there, average miles away from campus, 32. Wow. <laughs> Their entire coaching staff never had to get on an airplane to recruit. That, not one that, time. Wow. Well, Houston's a country in itself when you look at it. It's not just yeah. football. It's great basketball recruiting. The baseball recruiting is elite. That's why those Big 12 coaches don't want them in the league. <laughs> That's exactly right. Shoot, look at UCF, too, and where they're at down there yeah. getting into That's no a doubt. totally different story. But, Luz, I want to talk about a couple of these Thursday night games. I am so Jack Tan and emotional about the Thursday slate. In that order? It, in that order. I love it. Hey, Jack, then Tan, then, then emotional. emotional. That's <laughs> exactly right. Let's start out with Purdue and Penn State. I love okay. Purdue in this game. I love what Jeff Brom's been able to do. I think he's the new day Bobby Petrino minus the motorcycle. And you look at Aiden O'Connell, what they return. Mm. I know that, you know, no David Bell, no Rondell Moore, but it seems like Purdue always finds a way and a couple guys always step up to become the guy. They've got a ton of momentum. And if you look at that schedule, they win this one. It could get really, really, really interesting for Purdue late in the season with the record they could have. You know, it's interesting that we're talking about Purdue right now. I happen to have both times they beat the number two team in the country a year ago. I had them on the road at Iowa when I was number two. Had them at home when Michigan State was number two. Wow. Hmm. And a couple of things stood out in both of those games. They were able to get away with it because they were so explosive in the passing game. And David Bell was such a difference maker. Yep. But they did settle in on a quarterback in Aiden O'Connell, which prior to that, in the first four to five weeks of the season, they hadn't settled in there yet. I have two, two chief concerns. Number one, they can't run the football. I mean, that was a very poor running football team. And the offensive line struggled to get pushed. They weren't dynamic in the backfield. So they were a little bit one-dimensional. And then how do you replace the George Kaloftis? Because that guy, he ain't just standing on street corners, man. He, he's a, he was a difference maker uh, on, a, on a defense that was a really sound, solid defense. And I think they'll be good once again. But if they can come up with some more balance on offense, come up with something to offset pass rush, something to help protect Aiden O'Connell, because everybody in the stadium, including the hot dog vendor, knows that they're going to be throwing it all over the field. And then defensively, can, they, can you manufacture a new way of creating pass rush with the loss of Carl Loftus? Yeah, and again, we always talk about trying to create some type of balance. Nobody's ever 50-50 if you are. No. It's, like, it's like a couple that says they never argue. Number one, I don't believe you, and if you don't, something's very wrong. <laughs> uh, but to me, I think you're going to see a lot of – they'll test it early. You'll see Purdue come out and see if they can get a little bit of push up front. If it doesn't work, though, I think Brom does such a good job of his modified runs, the way he's able to, to utilize the back out of the backfield in the passing game and try mm -hmm. and replace a little bit of that run game and negate the pass rush up front if they're struggling to protect by spitting the ball out and getting playmakers in space. So that's one thing to keep an eye on as well. Uh, I do want to ask you, speaking of Penn State, Sean Clifford, I know Noah Kane's gone, transferred to LSU. Uh, they've lost some weapons. But you talk about an offensive line that, that wasn't very impressive or wasn't getting a lot of push. Right. There's a lot of questions on that Penn State offensive line. And if Purdue is able to, to force their will on them, especially on third down and medium third down and long, Sean Clifford without Jahan Dotson, he'll throw the ball up for grabs. We've seen it before. Yeah. Yeah, we have. And, you know, it's interesting because you go back to that game at Iowa that they were clearly in control of. Mm -hmm. And had Sean Clifford not gotten hurt, I, Penn State might have started, might have gone on a run. I, I, I'm convinced they win that game. 
They just became an at quarterback after that injury happened. So, number one, Sean Clifford's got to stay upright. He's got to stay healthy. It does have, a, 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 obviously, a, a connection to the offensive line. I'm going to be very interested to see. There's a true freshman that's going to be emerging for that offense named Nick Singleton. Yep. He's a running back. He's a difference maker. Um, and I, I know that's actually a position of strength for them overall in terms of depth. But if they can get some run game going a little bit, and maybe that, similar to what we were talking about with Purdue, can maybe offset some of the issues in the offensive line, at least slow down some pass rush and, 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 and keep Purdue honest on defense. I, I got to be honest with you, and I, and I happen to have Purdue uh, week two, excuse me, uh, Penn State week two at home when they take it on Ohio. So I'll be paying close attention to this game Thursday night. I don't know what to expect from them. I mean, mm-hmm. I, they've been so Jekyll and Hyde. And I know they have better players in what their record reflects, which is so interesting to me that, w- that we saw James Franklin get the offseason uptick in contract considering their performance on the field. So I, I think we're looking at a Penn State team that could go anything but five, anywhere from 500 to 10 wins. And I have no idea where it's going to fall in between. Yeah, that's why I'm excited to see it. Well, let's stay in yep. the Big Ten. I was telling my colleagues here, Michigan is so good, they have not one starting quarterback, but two. <laughs> uh, in your infinite wisdom, Tom, will you please <laughs> explain to me why Jim Harbaugh is naming a starting quarterback for week two before we suit it up in week one? It's biblical, Tom. It's biblical. Well, let me. it is biblical. Let me peel back the layers a little bit more because if what he's saying, if I'm reading between the lines or understanding him correctly, what he's saying is that he wants – each quarterback to have a full slate of plays, series, quarters to essentially iron out the position on their own. But but if you're truly wanting to do that, are we saying that Cade McNamara is going to play every snap in the opener? He's going to get my all question. four quarters and we're, we're, we're not going to uh, have the quarterback carousel and then the second week? Are we seeing Cade McCarthy or excuse me, Cade McNamara will not play? And J.J. McCarthy gets all four quarters, or are we are we starting, and then we're still going to rotate within the game like we have been? Because if you're going to do that, you're not solving any problem. You're not coming up with the answer to the equation. So I'm interested to see what they do in game. You know, to, to then decide. I, there's a part of me that kind of gets it. Okay, well, we're going to give Cade this this entire game. Let's see what he does. We're going to give J.J. this entire game. Let's see what he does. No screwing around. No rotating. Now we're going to go back to the drawing table. We're going to say this guy performed the best. He's going to start week three. But I don't see them doing that. I, I still think they're going to play both guys in both games. Yeah, what we were talking about is no two guys are 100% identical. You've gone through a spring practice. You've gone right. through an entire fall camp. No two guys are 100% identical. You have every single rep they've thrown in fall camp on tape. Start the better yeah. guy. And if for some reason they are, then you make a decision. You either start the guy with more experience who just got named team captain or start the guy with yeah. more eligibility and more upside. And there's precedent for this because Jim Harbaugh had to do this with Alex Smith and Colin Kaepernick. Yeah, well, well, to, uh, Tom, yeah. like, we know who Cade McNamara is. Like, why? Right. Some people are like, oh, well, you know it's a battle. We don't know who the guy. We know who Cade yeah. McNamara is. I'm his not saying ceiling is right here. His, his head's right here. That's, yeah, that's exactly right. Like, we <laughs> know who Cade is. But you know what? It yeah. was good enough to save your ass. Yes. If you want to be honest. I mean, so yep. to me, it looks, and we can look and, and break it down and go play by play. It looks to me like Harbaugh is trying to appease both guys. And that never works. It never works, and I just, transfer again, portal. You're, yeah, you're transfer portal, there it is. and what happens in that locker room, all of a sudden, if Cade McNamara, who you just named team captain, goes and throws for four bills, four touchdowns, runs the offense smoothly, then J.J. McCarthy goes out there and has a good game against Hawaii, not as efficient, but makes a couple wow plays. Now you start dividing the locker room into, well, this guy should play, or this guy should You're, you're playing with fire, man. I said it, I said it Monday. Yeah. You're playing with fire. I agree, and I'll tell you this. I'm curious to know if he would have made this move if their first three games were different opponents. No, sure. no chance, Tom. Yeah. No chance. I agree. Who you start if you play Ohio? That's exactly start right. Start that guy. Go ahead, Blaine. Right, exactly. All right, I'm going to go to the Booster Club here. Uh, real quick uh, question, Tom. Is Batman a superhero? Yeah. Uh, yeah, he's a superhero, but he's not a genetically enhanced superhero. Okay. So no powers. His, his superpower is wealth. Okay. Yeah, he's rich and nuts. Yeah, I, love I didn't it. know that yeah. was up for yeah, debate. Yeah, he's rich but. and he's nuts and he's brave and he's and he's courageous. That's I exactly right. Which is harder to but do. But he's not. I mean, he's yeah. not. Not this guy. Yeah, for oh, sure. Is that is that I mean, Cam Newton? 
<laughs> Looks just alike. <laughs> right, he wishes. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Kyle Kennedy wants to know what would be better for college football, Oregon, BYU, both undefeated undefeated in their week three matchup, or Bama, Tennessee, both undefeated in their week Ooh, seven That's matchup. a good question, Kyle. Oh, Bama, Tennessee. Are you kidding me? <laughs> Nobody cares if BYU is undefeated in week three. Whoa. <laughs> oh, I mean, wow. I, I like BYU. I've, I've called a ton of their games the last couple yeah. of years. But is anybody really that invested in whether or not Oregon and BYU are, are undefeated in, in, in week three? I think a lot of people are invested uh, in that Alabama-Tennessee matchup. That would be That would be huge. And it's at Tennessee. You talk about the Vol Navy, it looked like an armada around there. You oh, think we're goodness. getting invaded by the Netherlands. It'll be a regatta. Oh, no. The Argata. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Travis Elrod, uh, hashtag Ask Tom, can Houston be a conference champion contender in its first year in the Big 12? Potentially, yeah. I actually have them right now uh, going undefeated. I, I think that they're going to be an undefeated ball club. They're going to be this year's Cincinnati. They're going to mm. avenge the Texas Tech loss. I'm a little concerned about the UTSA uh, game because I think Jeff Trailer's done a remarkable job there, and they're they're growing as a program. But they don't play Cincinnati or UCF in, this, in the conference. So if they if they kind of ride off into the sunset on a high, we already kind of touched on the advantages they're going to have in recruiting with the wealth of talent that's right outside of their campus. Um, I don't think there's any question they're they're the team that is built for the long haul of power five football. They've already got the enhanced indoor facility. They've got a stadium that's less than what, five years old that they can always uh, uh, add to as well. So they've invested to get to this point and then they've got the player pool to pull it off. Yep, yeah, Houston's dangerous, man. They're dangerous. Yep. There's a couple programs that are just sitting on, on, on the hill. I'll tell you another one with where they're at, Coastal Carolina. So yep. Remember I said that, you're right by the beach. It's an unbelievable oh, place. Yeah. There's talent all around you. It's that's one reason why Jamie may not leave. I just they're they're scary over the next seven to ten yeah, years in general. I agree. All right, Dylan. Wait, by the way, which one of you guys was going all JJ or JT Daniels on us? This guy, what right? Is here. JT, what is JT Daniels? This man, done? hold on. This man I mean, hates on Kirk he's, Cousins. He's yeah. but just he's absolutely. won and got well, hurt. I mean, he tore his ACL. Nah. Yeah, he won a few games. Like this was, the guy wasn't twelve and three. I mean, he, he <laughs> looked pretty good. In, I mean, I mean, he looked pretty good in those games that he tore his ACL. I mean, what do you expect? Why, what do What are you expecting from JT Daniels? Something he, is wrong. There's something missing. Why can't he get on the field? There is something missing there, and it ain't it ain't a physical attribute. There's something not I'm, right. I'm with you, man. I, are we, I but are we questioning though. his talent on the field? That's why I mean, you go back. I mean, they well, were roll, they were rolling kids at Georgia just as sets and Bennett was. I mean, he was thrown for well, fists. They were beating kids by forty. But why wasn't JT able to do the same thing with that caliber of player around him when the walk on was? Mm. Well, are we are we questioning JT's leadership? Is that what it is? Is there something wrong with him mentally? I mean, I'm, I mean, I'm I wondering, haven't if, heard I'm wondering if it's it, I, yeah. I'm wondering if it is. Is, is he slow to process? Is he, is he not a, an ideal decision maker? Is it pre-snap diagnosis? What is it? Mm. We've all seen him throw the football. He can throw the football. But what something's not right. I'm Tom, I'm in that camp too. It just it's again, and injuries happen. I get it. There's been people yeah. that are great players that that went got booby miles. Like I've I've seen it before. But right. but when you look at JT and when we talk to him, I'll never forget this, David. When we were at SEC Media Days mm -hmm. two years ago and we talked to him, the minute we got done talking to him, you looked at me and you were like, I do not believe in this guy. Mm -hmm. I'll never forget you said that. And it's I've I heard a lot of people say that, by the way. Yeah. I've I heard a lot of people come away from conversations either with him or about him that have the exact same sentiment. Well, look, I'm, a lot of those California guys are just different, and then some of them go out and win the Heisman <laughs> Trophy, right? Bryce Young's one of them. I know that they have a different mentality <laughs> about them, but yeah. we haven't seen it on the field to back it up. I, what do you think the ceiling is right here at West Virginia or for a possible professional career for him, Tom? I, I don't know how good they are around him, guys. Yeah. I think that's my, my biggest concern is, you know, is Graham Harrell coming in to save the day? I know that's a bit of a reunion there, um, so there's familiarity. Um, are they going to run the football? Because Offensive line's bad. 
bad. And at least Neil Brown was a, 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 a broken branch off the air raid in the sense that he wanted to run the football. Mm -hmm. Graham Hill doesn't want to run the football. Have you watched USC the last couple yeah. of years? Yeah. I mean, horrendous in the run game and poor in the offensive line. So I just don't know how well that's, that's going to go for them. Um, defensively, I had, uh, had them two years ago during the COVID year, and I really liked some of their young players. But I think they've got a long way to go. And, and, and listen, Pitt, Pitt is – they're bringing some, some dudes now on, on defense. Sure. Now, I'll, I'll say this, guys, and maybe I'm the Debbie Downer on the quarterback position today, but I, I'm not as sold on Keaton Slovis either. I mean, he's been good at times, streaky at others, and often injured. Yeah. And I think those three – and he was playing in such a simplified quarterback-friendly offense, which is going to be vastly different than what he's going to be asked to do in, in Pitt's offense. So I'm kind of sitting back and, and taking my time and hedging my bets a little bit on him. I think they're going to be good in a lot of areas, but I, I want to be convinced at quarterback too. Yeah. Well, Tom, you're good in a lot of areas. That's why we're bringing you on weekly, my friend. What game? What's the first game you're going to call this year? I got Clemson, Georgia Tech on Monday night. Yeah. Uh, Labor Day, prime time. <laughs> that Chick yeah. Is that the Chick-fil-A game? Is it in, yeah, in the well, ATL? Yeah, it's the Chick-fil-A kickoff weekend. Yeah, you yeah. got Chick Oregon Chick -fil -A and, weekend. Uh, Georgia. Yep. And yeah. then yeah. Uh, us on Monday night from uh, Mercedes-Benz Stadium. Yeah, Jeff Collins is a good friend of ours. We went there yeah. last year in the facility. Man, I hope they can turn it around. I, don't I know. Think they're gonna I do Clemson, too. But, you know, Jeff Sims, come on. Let's – come on. Let's go. Let, let's figure it he out. He got talent, man. He does. Put it together. Well, Tom, he had to overhaul that roster. I'll never forget when we were talking to him before the year last year. He was like, when I took this job, there were 12 running backs on scholarship. Yeah. 12. Yeah. Mm. People don't understand, like, flipping and, a roster, it, it, it ain't easy. And it couldn't have come at a worse time because for 18 months, you could not go on the road and recruit, and a yep. player could not come on your campus. So he had to do that or attempt to do it mm. in the smack dab middle of a pandemic when you've had an offensive system in place for 11 years, right? So, listen, have things been ideal? No. Have they gone the way that they wanted to? No. Has it gone as fast as probably people were expecting? No. But I'll say this about the administration. Give them a break on the schedule, will you? Oh, my God. I mean, goodness. you're playing oh. Ole Miss, Georgia, and UCF? Come oh. on. Give, uh, give them a chance. Yeah, it's brutal. Whoever's doing the scheduling for, for Georgia Tech and Arkansas – Need to take a long walk off a short pier. But, Tom, real quick, one upset yeah. you like this weekend. Is there one game you got your eye on, you kind of got circled, you're doing the Doctor Strange on, you know, two <laughs> hands on the temple, two other hands or two other fingers making a circle? Yeah. Um, to be honest with you, the Thursday night matchup, the, the, the Penn State-Purdue matchup. Yes. It's another one. Yeah. Yes. Added to the yeah. list. I feel much better got my, now got about my it. eye on it. I got yeah. my eye on it. Yeah. And, oh, and by the way, don't be surprised. If Florida State plays their tail off Sunday night. Ooh, Look, I was going to uh, ask him about that one, too. I was going to say, let uh, LSU go ahead, let me down. Go ahead, spill the beans out, Tom. Hear that. Listen, no, no. Now, think about, think about this. Just rewind to 2019 when that game was scheduled, right? You've got LSU coming off maybe the greatest college football team, arguably, of all time. Maybe mm -hmm. one of them, all right? Mm -hmm. You've got Florida State literally a, a, a train wreck in every way, shape, and form. Fast forward to now, and if that thing would have been gotten a line from the 2019 year, it would have been LSU probably by 24. Mm -hmm. I think it's LSU three. Is it yeah. three right now? Mm -hmm. Yeah, or it okay. was it's three somewhere around there. Yep. And now you look at where LSU's come to, and you look at how all of a sudden Florida State's starting to improve. You know, they actually look like a, an organized unit. I don't know. I think that one's going to be intriguing on Sunday. Yeah, if it was anywhere other than the Superdome, I yeah. think it'd be really I know. weird. I, I, know. I get kind of gun shy because I was high on LSU going to play UCLA last year before Zach Charbonnet pulled their pants down in front of a, the whole high school. But uh, no, it's that's gonna be an interesting game. Tom, we appreciate it as well, my friend. As yeah. always, excited to see you next Wednesday, and let's get this thing kicked off. You got it, guys. Thanks. Have a great weekend. Enjoy college football. You For too, sure. brother. Thanks, Everybody man. go follow Tom on social. You. you know what? Do we want to go fantasy tip of the day while I'm walking over to the board? Let's do it. Of, of it's getting really tight. I hope we can remain friends after this. Philosophy on dual threat quarterbacks. Get a lot of points for yardage on the ground, but potential injury, Jake. Yes. So if I'm going back and forth and you're in this situation where, hey, I can take a good dual threat guy or do I take a good true pocket passer? I've always been... I've. I've got the same MO. 
If I'm hiring somebody, you know what? I want you to be good at multiple things. Mm -hmm. If I want a quarterback, I want you to be good at multiple things. And you know what? I may not be able to do math when they start putting different letters in it, but I can add, and I know you get four points for a passing touchdown and six for a rushing touchdown. And you get 10 if you do one of both. Our league's five points for a passing touchdown. It's five points for a passing uh, touchdown. Yeah. Isn't and that what we said? Six for a rushing? Yep. Five, six for rushing, yes. Okay, okay. But still, Apparently more for rushing. More okay. for rushing. I was close. You get more for rushing. Mm -hmm. We get the point. I just feel like I need a guy that can do more. And you eat up yards on the ground, that's points as well. And if you're able to run, it keeps the defense more off balance, which leads to more big what? Big plays, which leads to more what? Big points, which leads to more what? Big day for the kid in fantasy. Blaine? Well, it, it depends. The thing about quarterbacks, it's it's such a tight race regardless. You got to look at the number, like the number of scoring points from quarterbacks. Don't ruin my fun. It's not a huge difference. Um, obviously, you want a guy who has some mobility because that's just extra points. But it gets to a point, if you do draft a quarterback and that is your guy, how much are you risking him getting hurt? Yeah. Um, a Lamar Jackson. Uh, yeah. a, a Kyler Murray. Um, Damn. A risk for reward is there. Um, Josh Allen is, uh, is a big piece of he's that. He's like, is Josh like the perfect blend? But Josh though? is Bosch, he's a Josh is a uh, size of most DNs, you know, yeah. linebackers. So a little bit different with him. Um, I feel like the thing with me, quarterbacks, I'm a late drafter when it comes to quarterbacks. Um, you know, if you can get anything in the realm of, you know, Joe Burrow's going so late in drafts right now. I mean, it's an easy yeah. steal. So I'm not worried about whether you can run or not. I'm worried about who's around you. Mm -hmm. What's your running back look like? What's your offensive line look like? Who are your receivers? Um, and when it gets to that point, you know, I, I, I'm taking skill positions, <clears throat> skill positions and deepening my bench before yeah. I'm worried about going into mobile. No, mobile. agreed. And because um, point scoring quarterbacks are not really, there's not really a scarcity there. You could take a flyer on a mobile guy and you if could. he gets injured, you can pick someone up off the waiver wire. Uh, what I say about dual threat quarterbacks all the time, oftentimes you're not, uh, um, you're not leaving the pocket to necessarily go get yards on your feet. It's to extend plays even if you end up throwing scramble the air. This is why Josh Allen's able to have so much success and I think Kyler Murray's able to have success like that. Even someone like Russell Wilson. So a mobile Mobile guy, even though they may not necessarily be picking up a lot of points for you on the ground or with rushing touchdown, they're extending plays and they're getting the ball out later when you have a scramble drill. Yeah, Blaine, has Cody Nason put out, yeah, look at look at the Crane & Co. Picks tracker account. Everybody go follow the Crane & Co. Picks tracker account. It's at Crane Co. Picks. Has he put out the graphic yet of exactly the same? Let me see if I know it too. in my mind, but I want to make sure I'm double checking it's like having the study guide. Is the answer right? Okay, it is. She'll never see this piece of paper. Um, I do not question. see it. Um, you don't see it. But you got to think, so what were you yesterday? Here's, I can, let me just go look at it. I've, I've got, I, okay. So I went 0-2 yesterday because Atlanta let not only me down, but everybody on the planet with a brain. Yankees won. And, I'm, and, and Well, the Dodgers beat the Mets, thank goodness. But Brian Snitker, please, do just please like tell everybody to do their job. Like Will Muschamp clip, punch okay. on the board. I'm 29, 26, and 1. David, what'd you go yesterday? I, I went, went 1 and 1. 0 oh and 2. Okay. I was 29 and 24 yesterday. Okay, so you. I'm, 20, you went oh I'm looking at what I'm at. I'm 29, I'm, I'm 26, looking at and units. 1. Okay. okay, so you're up 0.5 units. 0.5 units. So that means Woo! you're 30 and 26. No, that, that means, that's right. Did we say we were going to round up? Yeah. Okay. So he has 0.5 over his 29. Yeah, so it's 29.5 and we round up. Okay. Remember, we said we we're going to round up. Yes. Um, yes. So I'm at 30. You're at 30 and 26, Cone. So we're tied? I, so we are basically tied. Okay. We are. This is an absolute Man. tie. Man. Yeah, y'all are tied. We're tied. Baby Cone is 29 and 27. He went 2-0 and o yesterday, Blaine. What were his units yesterday? Um, what was his bets odds-wise that he hit yesterday? Um, I just need— Oh, here it is right here. He, he know hit— um, That's how I get his units. Baby Cone, uh, he hit a minus 105. Okay. And he hit a minus 135. Seven. So You're looking at picking up twenty nine, twenty seven, and he's probably, you know, four and a half units down. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. And you're going TTP because you're up like uh, ten units. Or yeah, I'm up nine ten. Yeah, nine ten units. So it's coming down to tonight. That's what it's coming down to. And it goes by win percentage. Cody Nason. Right? Uh, Cody Nason's in the chat. Says wait on Sergio to post on the pick tracker. Come on, Ben. Let's go. Let's get up. Let's go. Let's get it rocking. So and I do think, and let me throw this out here, maybe let's, let's get it out here. If we do see something that, you know, is different than what we thought, if no games have been played, I feel like if either one of y'all would like to change your bets, you should be able to. I agree with that. Okay. Like okay. Truce? Captain Planet? Earth? No, yeah, yeah. I mean, I, if, if the units aren't what we thought they were and you have to change your bet for better odds to win the month, 
then you should be able to change it. I fair think. enough, fair enough. All right, so here's, here's what we got so far, at least to this point. Give me the Dodgers Mets Nerfy minus 143. DeGrom, mm. Mr. Anderson on the mound for the Dodgers. Come on, man. Let's just let's just figure it out. Then why not? Let's go back to the well. The Braves let me down last night. See if they'll make up for it. Give me the Braves to score first and win at plus 102. It's the Rockies, man. It's the right. You had two gloves the whole time. And yeah. You missed the first pitch. Come on, man. You can't we lose can't to be the Rockies. To the bottom Braves. I'm telling you, Braves, you can't be losing to the Rockies at home with your ace and on the, the mound Mets late in the, the season. Dodgers. Come on, man. That's the thing about Max Fried that scares me a little bit. He's got a little choke artist in him, man. He's got a little bit in him. Now, I know he didn't give up a ton of runs. All right, they lost three to two. But he wouldn't come out there shoving, especially when I took him over five and a half strikeouts. You don't get a strikeout in the first two innings. Now you can't you're gonna look three me runs in the eyes. The Rockies, and I mean, you don't deserve to win. Okay, take your shots now. I know, no. Am I wrong? You're not wrong. I mean, Max Reed, you're gonna have three runs and we're losing. You're not wrong. Uh, man, this month, I mean, talk about giving yourself a chance in the fourth quarter. Yeah. That's yeah. all you want. That's it's it. A shot on the last day. Then you're baby. gonna break late. So I came in looking for a couple home underdogs. You know, home oh, underdogs. No. Oh, Found no. the Rangers. I've never bet on the Rangers before. This may be the last time as well. <laughs> I'm going to take the Rangers money line plus 120, okay, with Martin Perez on the mound, 2.69 ERA, 10 and 4 record. You're at home. Figure it out. And then I want the Twins, Red Sox, Nerfy, minus 130. Michael Walk on the mound. Joe Ryan, a couple Waka ERAs under three. Huh? Said Waka Flock of Flame. Waka Flock of Flame. Let's win this month down to the stretch here. I'm going hard in the paint, Cone. You love to see it. Well, All right, Houston Texans. Top Houston of th- Texans? I've done that twice today. Understandable. <laughs> Astros versus Texans. That is understandable. Um, top of the first. Astros versus. What are you talking about? Start are you over. Having a What'd I say? You said Astros hold on, hold versus on. Texans. Okay, Astros yeah, versus Rangers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. For Good some reason, Damian Pierce, Damian Pierce has been in. I have a draft today, and Damian Pierce has been in my head. They just released Marlon Mack. Get out of my and head. I keep telling him, I got to draft this kid. I got to draft this kid. All right, uh, top of the first. Come on, I'll TV. Come on, I don't, I don't need you taking five pitches. All right, I need you swinging the first pitch. Let's hang a slider up there, hanger and banger. All right, hopefully Dansby, uh, Dansby Swanson is not batting first. Little Braves-Rockies, bottom of the first. First pitch, put it in play. That's plus 1,400. Uh, <laughs> Astros-Rangers is plus 1,100. Hey, guys, I'm nine units up. This Please feels like don't. a win to me regardless. Please you know how it's funny no he says that He's like, well, you know, I'm nine units up. So I just wouldn't think I'd be nine units up at this point. I went, well, you hit Altuve, came through for you twice. I can't believe I it. feel like you owe it. Like, you need to write him a personal thank you. I know. He cheated. He's gotten away with enough. <laughs> oh, my God. You <laughs> just away with enough. You just change up on the guy like that? Oh, Blaine switches up. up really no, up. No. We're on theme. Yeah, I like I mean, that. he got, a, I mean, a World Series, and they cheated. So what do I owe him? <laughs> <laughs> All right, we're going to go to the Boost Club leaderboard. Dragon B. Flamin. Yeah, he does. 6 and 0. Katie Rose, 1191, 6 and 0. Sammy V is 4 and 0. So is Kyle Kennedy, Theo Dictator. Our buddy C Step underscore 04 is 2 and 0, as well as Jay Stewart Ranch. Wildcat Cubs fans, 2 and 0. Dink and Flicka, 27 is 2 and 0. And Neftink is 1 and 0. Neftink. Make sure you put those bets. Go to Twitter right now. You follow Crane and Company. It's at Crane Company. Then you go see the tweet I put out. At Jake Crane underscore, it says booster bets. Wednesday booster bets specifically. Put your bet under there. You'll read the rules. If you go to DraftKings right now and use the promo code booster, you get literally $200 in free bets off a $5 bet. Do it now. What else do you guys want from us? I've called these people. I've negotiated the contract. It's a great deal. I feel like the Kevin Costner from Draft Day right now. What's going on in the booster club? Look, let me be honest with you. You're getting called out on odds right now. I'm getting called out? Yeah. What happened? What, what, what'd I do? BJPS says, where did Jay get Dodgers Mets nerf you at minus 140? It's at min- minus 170 on DraftKings. I got it. It was minus 143 this morning. That I would not make that number up. Well, he's calling you a liar. Check, check out Barstool. Who, is that? Who said that? Jessup Polk? That would be... BJPS, BJPS on that first off. 09 xu 13 I don't know how to... I don't I, I, hold on. I've, I've got it pulled up right here. Let, no, we're, we're going to dig in here because I literally saw it this morning. That's such a weird number to make up. Andy Vela. Hey, look at this. Andy look at this. Vela. Look at this. First inning, under. Okay, yeah, you're using a different book. Okay. Yeah, um, I was just checking around the books. Today. Andy Vela says, blame betting on the fan in section 124, row 11, C4 to be wearing a blue shirt. And to be drinking beer <laughs> out of a hot dog it. straw. Cal Kenny's 5-0. and 
Kyle's five and zero. Kyle's five and zero, not four and zero. Kyle's five and zero. Okay. He says, I'm 5-0, oh, so I believe you, Kyle. We're, Kyle, I believe we're rolling you. to this. Uh, Sister Rick says we're rolling to the second half of the week. Let's go. Um, Christian Beard says, I'm just uh, sitting here waiting two years for UT to play AM again. I'm telling you that the game will be the most watched game in college football that year. It's been too long for us fans since they have played. I believe be a good one. Yeah, that'd be a really good one. Um, Utah, Arkansas, one. 2026. Um, Utah, Arkansas? Wow. M-, M. Hutton says, no one hates USC players and their former players quite like Tom Luganville. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Kyle Kennedy says Oregon and BYU being undefeated goes back to the question we asked um, yeah. Tom from earlier would mean Oregon would have beat Georgia and BYU would have beat Baylor chaos would be it'd be chaos happening in college football yeah it would. I, we're going to get some of that this first weekend there'll be a little chaos there'll be a lot more chalk um, I'll tell you I had a parting thought here Darby Lou my lovely wife wants everyone to know she came up with the toaster strudel line from Mean Girls. She did. And, and told me to put that in that get off the I, You know what? I think it speaks volumes about you as a man that you're willing to admit that your wife gave you an antidote. Now, Reed gives me good ideas a ton of times, and I know she's probably listening right now, so she's just, you know super smart and cool and stuff. There you go. I love it. That's All my right. parting thought. Paul. Paul. Who wins the month in betting points? <laughs> you know what? I, I, I got it. Baby Cone, 39%. Not an option. I'm going to do three options. That's three. Us three. Baby Cone wasn't an option. I can't do a fourth option. Oh, wow. I didn't know you hated children. Um, (laughs) Gibby, I'm going to say, I'm going to say they said Cone because he's wearing a blue jacket, Mm. 39%. Okay. I'll say that they said Jake, 39%. Thank you. All right. Who wins the month in betting, Blaine? 28%. Okay. David, 22%. Jake, 50%. 50%. So I still won. That means I'm going to lose. Hold on, hold on. I still won because I called that, and that's an extra yeah, unit you actually push, won. right? No, no, that's pick. not how we do it. So I'm at 31 no, and 26. No, 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 no. <laughs> Good luck no, tonight, boys. That's not how oh, I love it. I appreciate uh, it. 22%. I love, I love your creativity. just say that I'm, I'm disappointed and I'm hurt, Booster Club, and we'll get over it. Well, I'm going to say Booster Club, I'm not disappointed. I'm definitely not hurt. I'm actually the opposite of that. I am it was the Rangers impressed. pick, wasn't it? It was the Rangers pick that know. led him to that. Yeah, we'll see. But make sure you hit that like button. Hit that subscribe button. Tomorrow morning when we come on the show, there will be football being played later that day. And I, for one, am probably going to go home and write sonnets, sonnets, haikus, soliloquies, and whatever else you call a poem. Haiku, did I say that? I did I say haiku? One. Yeah. All right. Anyways, make sure you hit that like button. Subscribe as well. Check us out on all platforms, TikTok included. Until tomorrow, and like the chances of the Braves not letting me down tonight. We're going, going, gone.